Welcome to the Friday Night Lecture Series sponsored by the Scandinavian Heritage Foundation and the Department of World Languages here at PSU. To, this is the first lecture of the, of the season and uh, tonight's uh, speaker is Dr. Marlene Fulmer and she wrote her own thing here and I didn't even have to correct anything, I can just read her and she's so good she's even going to write her own obituary. <laughs> so I'll just read it all out here and you listen carefully because there's going to be a test afterwards. And Dr. Marlene Brømer lived in Finland for 10 years where she taught and studied at the University of Helsinki. She continues to work for the university and attend conferences and meetings in Finland. She's a member of the Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies and the Pacific Asian Modern Language Association, Association at whose meetings she has delivered conference papers on Nordic and comparative literature. This was a mouthful. No <laughs> comments. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so Dr. Boehmer currently teaches at Clackamas Community College and Portland Community College as an adjunct instructor in English. No dangling modifiers tonight. Her article, ESL in America, Teaching Multilingual Second Language Students Academic and Technical Writing, was published in September 2015 by the Language Center at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Now, here you go of Nordic American descent. Uh, it's finished actually. Marlene continues to support work at Finlandia University in Hancock, Michigan. She has traveled extensively in all of the Nordic countries except Greenland and the Faroe Islands and has developed a new academic interest in examining this and researching Nordic crime fiction, and that's why we're here tonight. We're going to hear about crime fiction, Nordic crime fiction. So that's welcome. Okay, okay. okay. thank you very much. Okay, thank you um, all for coming. I'm sorry about the change of venue here, but that loud hum in there was just going to be too distracting, and I wanted you to be able to hear, and me to hear myself. So. Uh, first, I want to thank the Scandinavian Heritage Foundation for inviting me to speak tonight on this Nordic theme. And thanks also to Finlandia Foundation Columbia Pacific Chapter for uh, helping publicize this event. I've spoken here before on a different topic, so I'm happy to uh, share with you now my venture into unknown territories. Normally I would just speak extemporaneously, but due to the recent events uh, of the last 24 hours, I just feel more comfortable having my paper here. I'm an English teacher at a community college, and it's been a very tough time for us. So um, I'm going to carry on as best I can here. Previously, I was here talking about Aidan Sodegran, uh, Finland's Swedish poet, and Anna Akhmatova, a Russian modernist. They wrote at the turn of the 20th century and survived World War I. That was the result of many years of historical and literary research, groundbreaking in some ways for me, but obscure in the general scheme of things. I decided then I would turn my lens to another era and a new topic. Other research ideas presented themselves Knut Thompson, for example, uh, from Norway is very intriguing. But I decided to go with a more contemporary and popular culture theme, which is <coughs> crime fiction. share with you. This is going to come eventually. And um, I'm going to talk about them a bit by bit. Uh, there was a Washington Post critic who said of Nordic crime fiction, they're all usually placed in cold, dark, wintry settings with people drinking a lot to keep warm. There's the general gloominess of people 
to see resign to the worst thing happening, there's not much humor. <laughs> but, like others, I was swept away in the enthusiasm for the Millennium series of crime thrillers uh, by the Swedish journalist uh, Stig Larsson. I wasn't going to read it, but everyone that I talked to that summer talked to me like this. <laughs> That's why I said, oh heck, I'll read it too. So, um, but the length and breadth of these novels was hard to resist, and also the heroine, Lisbeth Solander, was just compelling. So I ended up reading all of those. Later, Swedish films were made of this book, American films, and that kind of strengthened the allure of Nordic fiction on both sides of the Atlantic, I think. <laughs> now, many of you have probably read this series, and that may have whetted your appetite for other Swedish crime fiction, or even for books from other countries. In fact, some of you may be more well-read on this topic than I am, because I'm an English teacher and I spend most of my time reading student papers. <laughs> but anyway, um, there'll be some time at the end if you have questions or if you want to comment on something that you've observed in your reading. I'd be really interested in hearing that. Um, so first, uh, this is a kind of graphic showing everyone on the truck of social dem democracy, which is a little broken down there. But everyone must come along, it says. It's that easy. So that's kind of a, a Swedish uh, cartoon promoting and uh, showing the number of uh, immigrants who've come into the country. And here we have a picture of the late uh, Stig Larsson. So my question that I'm posing here is, why do people uh, read this literature there? Is it an escape, as it is usually in England and the UK and, uh, and the US? Or is it um, designed as an expose of some problems and issues? So that's what we're going to look at. But first, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to discuss tonight. Because, as you can see, there are really there's a lot of material being produced there. And uh, it's a daunting task that I've undertaken here. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the history and uh, something about how we've come to this place today where each country is producing more and more of these novels. They have some of the same characteristics of American and British detective stories, uh, but I'm gonna invite you on this journey looking at some random recent uh, novels from Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. The questions I'm trying to answer are, why does Nordic crime fiction have such a social conscience? <coughs> and do people read to forget their troubles, or do they seek more from this genre? <laughs> Finally, what does religion have to do with the popularity of this frightening pulp prose? Welcome. Scandinavian club? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, we had to move into a different room. So. I wondered about that. We yes, there's a loud noise in there. So come oh. in if you can find a seat. Welcome. Yes. Oh, I guess I can sit right there. oh, you have your own seat. You can sit right there, perhaps. Just not in the doorway. Have your own seat. Okay, thank you. Bring your own seat. Yeah. Uh, one more caveat. Among the issues that I won't discuss are uh, the connections between the texts and the film variations. I'm sure there are some graduate students or scholars somewhere who are busily working on this topic, and I will probably get into that eventually in some way, but uh, at the moment I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But there are some uh, very interesting questions. For example, uh, Hannah Mankell's work, uh, some of the stories have been compiled and then films have been created, so they're not actually a film of a specific book. And uh, so there's lots of interesting things coming uh, along with this. Kenny Mankell, maybe, has anyone read him? Lots, yes. It says, have you read them all? This is what it says on the back of this book. Look at how many there are. So he was really uh, kind of the king, or not the king, but he was 
uh, very popular before Stig Larsson um, came along and kind of burst everything open. So some people were kind of like, well, who's this Larsson fellow? Because Al Michael has been around for a long time. So, um, but he is, again, a whole topic in himself. So I'm not going to say too much about him, but I'll refer to him from time to time. Welcome. We had to move into another room, sorry. So, um, so I'm, I'm not talking about him, because though he's very famous and popular. And the other person I am not talking about is, where did he go? Uh-oh, he's lost. He's not here. He's lost in my, my head, perhaps. Oh, no. Joe Nesbo. Who's read Joe Nesbo? Lots of people. Oh, look at these stalwart people. He is really um, gruesome. <laughs> and he has taken, I, I would say now that he is the most popular. I'll just go outside of, uh, since Larson has uh, passed on. He's now the most popular one, I think, of the Nordic fiction writers. And he has taken that gruesomeness to new levels <laughs> of morbidity and uh, obscene, horrible, graphic. Uh, but apparently that doesn't matter because people lock these books up as fast as they can. And um, it's, he's been translated into so many languages. Uh, but they are really, they're pretty tough going for some people. So, um, and again, he is a writer that is unto himself a whole study. So uh, perhaps there are some courses coming along here on uh, current fiction here at PSU, I don't know. But um, he is somebody who takes a lot more um, attention. What links Nesbo to Larson, uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about a bit, is the focus on social commentary and the lament over the condition of the welfare state. And in fact, I think that Nesbo does even a better and more about this topic than, than Larson did. Larson had a uh, particular approach uh, about the treatment of women, about violence against women, and he really conducted that through all of his, his novels and so on. And um, that's not necessarily a focus. Uh, Nesbo's got a kind of broader focus about what's happening to the, uh, to the welfare state. So uh, people think that the Nordic countries are nearly perfect societies in which to live. There's obviously something wrong in them if crime, and even horrible crimes, could occur. Norway's recent, a few years ago, mass murder by the insane Brevik occurred after Nesbo's rise to fame, but nonetheless similarly signifies the deep dissatisfaction that some find in the arms of the welfare state. And so it also has to do uh, with one of the issues that's breaking the spell of this welfare state, um, even at this very moment as we speak, uh, because of immigration, and now it's gone beyond immigration, as you know, to um, to the refugee crisis. So I'm just back about 10 days from Finland, where I was observing this refugee crisis unravel uh, firsthand, and it's, it's really pretty uh, frightening and terrifying for people in lots of different ways. I don't really know, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. So two separate issues, though. The issue of immigration has been handled through a legal process. Uh, the refugee situation is happening outside of a legal process. And that's one of the problems for, for both the government and for, for people um, and their safety. So, uh, but that's where people want to go. Today's news said that the number one destination Iraqis are choosing is Finland. So, yeah. yes. Um, we can come back to that topic later on if we want, but it wasn't uh, part of my talk originally <laughs> since it just happened. It kind of just blew up. Anyway, I'm. Um, I'm talking about all of these books 
um, in that or in English translation. Occasionally, when I delve into a novel, then I will try to uh, read it simultaneously in the original language and see uh, when I have questions and so on. But in this case, so what this tells us is that these are all authors who have risen to the top in the native uh, language, and then they're so popular that they're being translated to English and other languages, of course. What are but, the Danish ones? Uh, here's the names from right here. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's going to be one of my main topics. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm not very bad, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I want to just say something uh, about some of these. I'll put all of them up here since you can't all see the uh, table. Um, so these are some of the ones that I'm not talking about, but it'll give you an idea and maybe bring up uh, some uh, authors that. Uh, you haven't heard of. So, uh, and there are people that I'm studying more in different ways. So, for example, uh, this is Jarko Sipela, who is a Finnish author, and he has been, uh, let's see, this has been, he's been published for quite a while in Minnesota by something called Ice Cold Crime. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, um, and he's, um, so he is really in this tradition that comes, say, from British and American police procedural uh, kinds of uh, crime stories. And this, and I'll talk about this one when I get to um, Harry Nukkinen later on, who's also a kind of procedural uh, writer. But uh, he's, uh, it's the time-tested pattern of following the solutions of an expert investigator. And uh, so he's uh, someone, he's got let's see, quite a few books, and this one is not even that new. This one is probably five years old. So he's, <coughs> he's somebody to watch. What's his name? Uh, Jarko Sipila. Oh, yeah, hard to, he's right there in <coughs> the front there. Then I have been waiting, I would say, Let's see when she did her first book, Lena Lechtolainen, also from Finland. Uh, this was 93 originally. It took almost 10 years for this to be translated to English. But when I first went to Finland, everyone was talking about her. And so she was kind of the first woman to break into this police procedural kind of genre. But she also, she has a feminine investigator usually and of course she has more maybe feminine themes than um, someone like Sipila would. You know, Sipila is, uh, there are criminals in these countries and even in Finland. They're treated very well when they get arrested, you know. They, <laughs> police call them their customers and their, their, um, their, the circumstances are like what would we would consider minimum security prison or something here where you know they have private rooms with televisions and probably internet access and things like that uh, but anyway after that then Lena Leitlainen has come to light and um, this is probably maybe the first second third she's got about three books now translated you can find these on Amazon and I think she's someone very interesting to watch and the older uh, establishment in Finland is really uh, supporting her and giving her, um, you know, helping her with uh, presentation and marketing and so on. So those are those are the uh, just two. There's others, but these are two that I'm looking at from Finland. Her stories are kind of family oriented. Uh, Norway, of course, all of these countries have more than I'm speaking about here, so I don't mean to slight any of them. Um, and Norway has, um, how do you say it, Karin Fossen? Where's Tom? <coughs> always gone oh, he, had, he went home. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was just teaching this book, he told me, before he left. Okay. This is Black Seconds. Um, so a child disappears in here. So again, it seems that we're not in the past really okay for uh, people to write about. Are now there after Nesbo and after Larson, these topics are all wide open, whether it's child abuse, interpersonal abuse, and things like that. Very tough subjects. Uh, but she is uh, one of the leaders on the Norwegian side, on the female side. 
There are some others I haven't looked into yet. I'm looking forward to it, but she's definitely, and again, she's got uh, four books here. Probably these are all coming uh, into English by now. This one did not take so long to get translated to English, though, because she already had uh, an agreement with the publisher. One of the problems for some of these smaller writers in, um, in the Nordic countries is that there's not an English language community where they live, so it's hard for them to get translated, and they have to really be able to make a big um, effect when they get translated and when they do a publication for them, so a print run. So it's a challenge, but she's, I think she's made that transition. Uh, in fact, this whole field has become more open to women since uh, compared to police detective stories in the past. And uh, so another one here is Camilla Lackberg, and she, uh, this is one of her books, The Stranger, that I have not read yet, but her most famous one was called The Ice Princess and uh, won the Grand Prix of literature in France in 2008. So again, when something like that happens, it's much easier to get translations and to get international recognition. And she's considered one of the leading uh, female writers in Sweden. Then, Uh, again, as I said, lots of women authors, and then they often have women detectives as their protagonists. So uh, one very popular one in Sweden is uh, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Marklund, and she uh, has, oh, at least a half a dozen books. Her are always just awaited as soon as it comes out in Swedish, it's immediately translated and available. And uh, we have a good picture of her from here, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a protector. You can kind of get the idea. She's a television uh, per, um, presenter, a news presenter. She's very glamorous. She's a national celebrity. Uh, she has a large family. She's like, every woman wants to be her, I think, in Sweden. She's so beautiful and successful bright, talented, a mother, she's got it all, all the bases covered, but then she writes very intense uh, stories with her female investigator, and again, she has a lot of feminist themes, uh, similar to Larson, actually, but uh, she, already being in the, the media world, had a, was kind of launched into uh, prominence because of that. And, uh, but it's not because she didn't deserve it, doesn't deserve it, her writing is very good. And uh, I just read this week that um, she has a new book coming out called Iron Blood. <laughs> and um, I will have to wait for that, but I'm sure that's going to be in English before the end of uh, next year at least. So I'll be waiting to see that one. She's, uh, she's quite good. Now, these are all people I'm not talking about today, so I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> then, um, we have uh, Iceland has had a long history of tale telling, as anyone familiar with the sagas will recognize. And the most famous uh, contemporary author, hello, welcome, Haldor. Laxness. We just got as far as Iceland. And Haldor Laxness, anyone met, uh, read him or heard of him? Some people, good. Yes, he's really worth uh, reading anything of his. He was a Nobel Prize winner in uh, 1997, and that really drew attention to uh, modern Icelandic work. He's not necessarily, he's not a crime fiction writer, he's more a historical family story writer, but um, it brought attention to uh, Icelandic writing, and now I just have one woman here, this is Irsa Sigurdóttir, and she, there, but there are at least a half a dozen, again, very uh, popular and prolific um, Icelandic writers writing crime fiction, and I, 
I'm not talking about this here because I really want to do a whole comparison of just the Icelandic writers because they're not like the Danish, the Swedish, the Finnish, the, and uh, the Norwegian. They really, Icelandic lore is just different. And it's a little bit more noir, it's uh, very uh, dark, and they have a very uh, perverse, uh, whatever you would call it, a dark sense of humor. So things that uh, we don't think are funny, uh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they think that eating sheep's brains in the middle of the winter is a good idea. And that's what gets you through. Yes? What was the name of the first author? This, uh, this one here? Or the man you just Oh, Haldor Laxness. Laxness? L A X N E S. See the one that won the yes. Nobel Prize? Yes. Mm -hmm. Laxness? Yeah. I would really appreciate the author of the uh, Ashes book that uh -huh. you held up. Yeah. Can you name her or spell her name for you? I'll, I'll give it to you at the end. I'd I pass it. Not make it. Okay, here's stuff. Here, you can look at it. You can yes, copy it right now. Yes. Very good. Wonderful. Um, yes, but these books are, you've heard of the sagas? They go on and on forever. Icelandic writers do not believe in editors. You could not get a job editing in Iceland. I will never go there. They're really big. So I don't have a lot of those books because they're on my Kindle. Because <laughs> I don't want to carry them around because they're really, they're big ones. Okay. So, so really that's worth a look. And then, I don't know how many of them have been got, have been filmed or transmitted to film, but that will be really interesting because Icelandic film, which you can watch, I'm sure, on Netflix if you haven't done any of that, they're really interesting uh, films now. We have some in the Portland International Film Festival as well, so don't miss Icelandic film. But I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Every country is represented, uh, except that I don't know anything about Greenland and I've never been to Greenland. So um, there, that remains to be seen. <laughs> yes, that is how it started with them. There, exactly. Yes. And I'm going to get to this Danish one when we get into a little more depth here. And I'm okay on time so far. Okay. Every country is represented in this outpouring, and. Uh, I have to tell you that it is the Danish scholars who seem to think that they know the most about this subject. And I have been told this personally by them. <laughs> so, so I now I now worship them and I read whatever they write and um, I'm very interested in what they have to say. Um, they are very detailed and they go back and analyze the development of all of these different um, crime fiction writers since the 50s, which is a long time uh, going back. So I won't take you all the way there, but what uh, they have to say is that um, crime fiction, this is uh, Kim Toft Hansen, and he says that Western crime fiction is philosophically tied to Western modernity. So. And this is where I come in with my past studies of modernity. I am looking now at how is crime fiction part of modernity, or actually it's post-modernity, because that's where we are now. But, um, <clears throat> and the, we have to remember that modernity came to the Nordic countries a bit later than it did to the rest of Europe. They were farther north, and they didn't uh, have as much communication as we have now. But when we think of modernity, that means uh, railroads, electricity, the development of the urban lifestyle, and so on. And so once that happened, then um, these kind of fictions, crime fiction, police procedurals, and so on, became more popular kinds of writing. And so this is, this is what Hansen is saying, anyway. From the 50s through the 1960s, uh, they just had crime fiction that was like other kinds of Western crime fiction focusing on police stories. Who done it, what happened, usually murders, some kind of uh, theft or something like that. And after the war, the police procedural was successful because security was very important. 
and people associated security with the police and a, a secure environment, and that obviously that was important to people. So that's one reason why these were so popular then. However, um, there was other kinds were other kinds of social changes that were happening then, as we know, and there was another uh, critic and scholar, Hans Jorgen Schantz. Uh, who's been studying this in 2008 and onward, and he said that what else happened, and we know this, but it's, he's talking about it in the context of this fiction, after the war there was kind of an enlightenment of individualism and a loosening of religious ideas, and people could have a self-determined relationship to God. And this was something new, so that also kind of opened the door for more of this kind of uh, crime fiction than had been in the past. Uh, another, uh, this is a Norwegian author, I believe, says that he thinks that social democracy is a transformation of Lutheranism and parish political culture to social liberalism. That's what he says is happening in the Nordic countries now. This system is not so much economic as philosophical, and it protects and ensures the safety and success of every individual, and uh, protects everyone from crime and poverty if they have a healthy and educated lifestyle. But, why then do we have all of these books? <laughs> what is happening here? What makes this genre suddenly so popular in the Nordic states in the 21st century? Do these texts represent an escape from reality, as such like reading has traditionally been? Or do they represent present a new way of analyzing contemporary society through literature? What audience do the writers have in mind when they pen their crime thrillers? Their reception in the native language is bound to be different than it is in translation, but nevertheless, uh, it should, we should be able to understand the various viewpoints and tactics that they have. What scenes can be identified across the Nordic countries? Will we get a view of the internal policies and politics? Can the outsider ever understand these works as they were intended, or does their value lie in other aspects such as voyeurism of an alternate culture and social system, possibly the latter. So the books that I'm going to be talking about here are, uh, first, some current fiction from, uh, these are both from Sweden, uh, but partly because they uh, speak to two themes that I was looking for here. This is, uh, so first of all, you have to know that this was a random sample of books that I picked up at the airport, in bookstores, wherever I was going, uh, in about six different countries in 2012. So there they were, they were translated to English, they were, everyone, they were being promoted, so I wanted to see what they were. So I read a whole lot of them, and I, these are just a few that I thought I would ask these questions of why do they have these uh, themes. And uh, <clears throat> we're talking about going from the police procedural that they had in the past to these other kinds of stories that uh, contemplate what's going on in the society and the culture. And one of the uh, people that I uh, follow in this, I don't have his book here, but uh, he's a very wonderful Finnish professor at the University of Washington in Seattle named Andrew Nestingen. He's of Norwegian ancestry, and he uh, has, uh, he is the real expert on Nordic crime fiction and all the issues that are going on in there. So I just take a few of his ideas here um, where he talks about uh, the development of police procedurals, for example. And, um, he says uh, that uh, even these procedurals are a critique of the neoliberal welfare state. 
And it's interesting because lacking a criminal base of any proportions to match that of European countries, or even the United States or Russia, uh, Nordic readers for, must find some other motivation for reading crime fiction. It can't be escaped. There has to be some social analysis or commentary embedded or it will not hold their interest. So there is a mode of realism that people like too, obviously. Otherwise, Joe Nesbo would not be so popular. And Steve Larson, they bathe their texts in blood and graphic descriptions of crimes beyond the ordinary imagination. Sexual crimes, crimes against animals and children are not taboo territory either. Well, Nestingen says that these stories have their roots in the early works of Raymond Chandler, whom some of you may have read. Yes. He says that the details of the police process are an integral part of these texts. But Chandler also breathed new life into his antagonists, the criminals, not to make them more sympathetic, but to make their words, worlds seem viable. Nestingen says that Chandler's detective, quote, fought for his convictions, even if he himself was a cynic, and the pervading criminality of his world meant his victories would be necessarily temporary. Again, that's a little gloomy. <laughs> Setting such ephemeral goals seems to also be the mode of these Nordic authors who focus on realism in their details, but they go a step further by fleshing out the reasons why their work is such an uphill battle in a world that is slowly coming unraveled and can no longer be explained by traditional notions of good and evil. And uh, if I were just talking about Mankell, and anyone who has read him knows that this comes out repeatedly in every one of his books, where he's plodding along, trying to think of what's uh, going on in the case that he's working on and then he's thinking you know why are all of these things happening things are just not the way they're supposed to be and what's happening to our country what's happening to Sweden and if you followed him to um, Latvia in some of the, the, what is it, the dogs of Riga um, he's looking he thinks maybe is there some answer in the Baltic countries, you know, that we have lost, something we've lost track of, and then other things happen there. And then, I'm just having a digression on Mankel, because then uh, if you've read others of his books, he ends up uh, also looking at Africa and incorporating African themes in all of this too. So that is really very postmodern, because previous, uh, you know, uh, writers would not be combining texts from other cultures, especially not that far away. So this is a very modern thing that uh, Mankell is doing. And, well, he lives some a part of the time in South Africa, so it's easy enough to understand why uh, he did that. He's a fascinating, I've heard him speak, he's a fascinating, uh, per you just want anything that he says. I would, I would listen to him wash dishes and sing, or what he's just, <laughs> he's got so much experience and so much uh, things that he's uh, thought about, uh, all these issues of what's happening to the culture. So one of the uh, people that I look to to see what is going on in these uh, societies is actually a Finnish scholar, and uh, I think he's got some kind of a theological background, but he's looking at uh, what he calls there is a surplus of evil in society in the welfare society. So what do you do if you try to do everything that you can to feed people, house people, educate people, take care of them, and yet there is still something evil? What, where does that come from? What, why is that there? Why can't it be eradicated? And so um, these are the questions that he's asking. And he's asking it as a theological question. Is it the absence of God that makes these writers seek answers to questions that no one dares to ask in a political context? So perhaps they ask those questions, but then they usually give their answers at the voting box. And uh, this is what we're seeing now, I think, in uh, at least in Sweden and Finland, that have a kind of anti-immigration government, uh, parts of the government anyway, they have a coalition government wouldn't that be a novel concept? <laughs> 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 ah, yes. Um, 
but anyway, there's there are things that are happening that that people are voting with their they're voting in the box. They may not say anything in public, but then these these huge changes as have just happened in Finland now, where um, they're uh, they're making drastic changes in the welfare state. Um, so throughout the 20th century, they built this society where everyone was taken care of. And then people have also turned away from the church. And uh, I don't if you're not aware, I'll just give a quick summary that everyone is in the church when they're born, and you have to ask to get out of the church. <clears throat> And um, in Sweden at the moment, something like 66% are still in the church. Um, and, and they estimate that 2 to 5% go to church on Sunday. And I can vow for that because I have seen that myself. But um, it doesn't mean that they have rejected the church. They just don't go to church. In Finland, they have a special website where you can go and get out of the church. And, and then you don't have to pay tax. That's one reason why some people want to get out. Uh, this week, people are leaving the Finnish church because um, the church in Finland has said that they are supportive of a new mosque that's being built by the rulers of Bahrain. People don't want the church supporting the mosque, so there are 100 people left the church last week or something like that. So, <laughs> These are all issues that are going on, and somehow they're related to this, this issue that Saarinen brings up here. Is there a surplus of evil? How can there still be a surplus of evil when people have everything else? Evil becomes an aberration, so perhaps the audience uh, is trying to answer this question. What is evil? Where is it? Why does it continue to exist? In fact, the audience may be less interested in what the police do to solve a crime or even what the final answer is. Rather, there is a perverse sense of voyeurism that informs this audience as they live vicariously looking through the constructed peephole of fiction at the actions of a tiny minority of people who cannot fit in and lash out at the perfect culture in which they find themselves. Sarnin says, well, Scandinavian social democracy creates its own secular problem of evil. Uh, he says that in Lutheranism, the goodness of God cannot be fully known, so it's not a surprise that it can't understand evil. He calls this the theory of the hidden God. And it does seem to suitably shroud unanswered questions, or at least leave the reader free to enjoy the more mundane, understandable aspects of thriller fiction, fear, chills, breathless anticipation, and finally, a resolution after which you can sleep without dreams. <laughs> um, Let's see, I'm going to be running out of time, so I want to show some of these others. It's more interesting. Take five to ten more minutes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so that was, um, I wanted to talk about Larson, who has a female uh, investigator. And in her story, a woman priest, there already were in the 21st century or the 20th century, uh, is found hung in a church. We don't even meet the, the priest alive. She's hung by page seven or something. And, uh, and it goes on from there. <laughs> um, this is actually not a finished church, I don't think. But it's built in, um, it's in Sweden. I think it's in Sweden. So, uh, and, but her stories, she's really interesting. I recommend her to anyone. Osa Larson, she's not related to Steve Larson. She uh, has a feminist uh, approach. She combines nature. Her uh, stories take place in Lapland and she uses all of the natural names of the places. Yeah. And she has a she-wolf that comes in and out of the story periodically. So she, she's just got everything in there. And uh, but she, don't, she'll make you afraid. She'll make you afraid. Okay. <laughs> It would be a magnet for loud noises today, but <laughs> okay. So um, 
Uh, then the other person, the other story I'm looking at here is, uh, this one is Amon's Kalentok, and he has, uh, his uh, story has to do, it's called Summertime Death. They can't even enjoy summer. <laughs> long summer nights. And so the long summer nights go all the way through this. So girls are found murdered terribly on a beach and so on. And the long summer nights, they really do get on your nerves after a while. Like at about the beginning of August. <laughs> and so, um, but this again, it says Larson Nesbo, now there's a new king of crime. So he is also very popular. I've got his brand new book I haven't read yet. And what happens in here is that his, again, very much like Monko's protagonist, uh, his uh, investigator, Malin, she starts talking about, and she has a daughter too, which makes it more poignant. She starts, as the string of murders continues in this small provincial town of Linshipping, Malin becomes obsessed with defining the, defining the allure of indefinable evil. Something serious was going on. That evil was on the move again. The indefinable dark undercurrent that flows beneath all human activity. She returns to this theme throughout the novel, saying at one point when she is near the lake where the body has been found, quote, it's not an intrinsically evil place. Not really. But there you have the juxtaposition of nature and something very evil. As the hunt for suspects becomes more complicated and immigrants are questioned without cause, Malin sees the protection she has al always felt in her city and culture become, quote, a plastered facade shielding insecure people. Anything can happen in this city where old and new collide, where rich and poor, educated and uneducated are in fact constantly colliding with each other where prejudices about those around you are aired like bedclothes. <laughs> yes, so um, his uh, narrator gives us another view of uh, sweeter society. How could evil lurk there despite the best intentions of the social democrats? <laughs> And she's busy trying to solve a crime, and everyone else is on summer holiday, which goes on for a month or six weeks or something. So uh, she finds the pool closed when it should be open, and she says, I think that the whole of Sweden is one big leisure committee consisting of people who've always had it too good and who don't have the faintest idea about sorrow. So some scathing, um, some scathing uh, reports in um, in that book and in, in also Larson's. Then I just stumbled upon this book, and I don't know if you've heard of this one, Osa, but this was hugely popular in Denmark. They call it the crime novel of the decade, Cecil Jo Gazan, and it is a scholar's delight. I was really lucky to find this. It's about a graduate student uh, finishing her dissertation. <laughs> but it takes place in the university, and there are dark hallways and loud sounds. And <laughs> perfect setting is for murder and deception. And so this is quite a long book. And uh, she weaves in all of the kinds of deception that happen in the academic world. Um, but there's actually a really creepy murder of uh, one of the researchers, and there's an international component. She drags some Canadians in here as well. Um, they're usually pretty harmless, but in this book, she makes, them, she makes even the Canadians sound malevolent. You know, that's uh, really something. Um, so this is uh, quite an indictment of the um, academic world, uh, but uh, so these Danish critics explained to me that uh, writers nowadays can't just get away with writing police procedurals, they have to put something else in it, it's expected. And this was a really interesting way of combining a crime with an academic world, and then there's a family in here who was never married and had some scandalous uh, life or something. So she, she's got a lot going on in this book, and that may be one reason why it was so popular. Um, 
what, yes, that was the publisher's hyperbole, but, uh, and I'm not going to tell the ending of that. Oh, let's see, it has some other things. Uh, Copenhagen, if you've ever been there, they have a fabulous sex museum. I don't know if you had time to see that, but um, you might have been at the old berry factory and drinking beer instead. But anyway, there also is sexual fetishism in here and uh, rubber costumes and, you know, I mean, not for the main part. <laughs> Okay, one more here, and then I'm going to hear some questions or some of something else from you. Uh, but I end then with um, this is a really quite unusual book, though, of um, Harry Newkinen. There's those long summer nights. This is like 11:30 at night or something. Actually, that's looking at Russia. That's not looking at. Picturesque. Hmm? Picturesque. Yeah, right, I like this. But it's a long summer night, so that's why I have to. Um, again, all these late evenings and uh, what I was talking about in um, Summertime Death, uh, the combination of beautiful nature settings are described in these books, and then they drag a dead body out of the lake. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, there's the dinosaur feather which is the, the academic search that's going on in this book. And here, you know, it's like a serious fellow, Knights of Awe. So this is a very odd book as a Finnish uh, text uh, because it has a Jewish police officer. There are like 10 Jews or 175 or 400 or 1,000, but there are not very many Jews in Finland. So it's very strange that he has a Jewish protagonist. Uh, the Jews in Finland have been there since uh, the 9th, 18th century, came over from Russia during some pogroms or something, and they, they're a long uh, established community there and so on. Uh, but for some reason, he decided to have a Jewish police officer, and the Knights of Awe refers to the period of um, between Yom Kippur and the New Year, I believe. I've Excuse me if I have that wrong, but anyway, uh, and that's when a crime is committed and then we have this police procedural going on uh, in Helsinki. So, um, he is, uh, again, he makes some commentary socially, but mostly this becomes an issue uh, with some Israeli or possibly other uh, terrorists. So he takes this out of the local uh, um, scene and talks about international terrorism, which is what I thought was interesting in terms of crime fiction here. And um, let's see what else he says there. So the thing about him is that he's very typically Finnish. Finns don't believe in small talks. They never chit chat about the weather or anything, and neither does he. He just goes straight <laughs> for it. So if you want to know who was holding the gun and where they were holding it and what they did with it, he's your man. So here's the kind of writing he has. The lieutenant on duty had called me about the body, which had been discovered by a paper deliverer, only because he knew I lived right next to where it had been found. The wake up come at 4.30, and I hadn't had time for my morning coffee yet. Around eight, I headed into town. I always took the same route. Frederick in Katu to Iso Robert in Katu, and once I hit Arotaya, I passed the Swedish theater down Keskuskatu to Alexi, where I jumped a tram. <laughs> I was usually able to walk to work in peace, but this time I only made it as far as Frederick and Katu before being stopped. Are you riveted? Yeah, that's what he does. So those are all. So, but one thing is very interesting for English readers. Uh, he has he keeps all the Finnish uh, locations in Finnish which is why I just read these crazy street names. And uh, there's also multiple languages in the text. So he's bringing up the fact that in our global world, things might be going on around us that we don't understand, whether it's crime or not, but it's a little bit disconcerting if crime is taking place in a language that you don't understand. So, um, uh, but that's one of the nice things about him, and he's very to the point. But here's an example of the kind of larger issue that he brings up. His police chief states, if an Israeli kills someone, chances are he's an average criminal, not a Mossad assassin. 
Weiss and Kaplan, the criminals in this story, are common drug traffickers who just happen to be Israeli citizens. One of the other officers questions, and what if an Arab kills? Is he always a terrorist? So it kind of brings up those issues. And there are uh, a lot of economic ties between Finland and uh, Israel. There are companies uh, doing business in both, both places. There's a lot of food imported from Israel to the north. Uh, there are a lot of issues. Some people boycott that food because they don't agree and so on. So um, this is a very political book, but it's hidden in his police procedural, very matter-of-fact style. So, okay, that is all we have time for here. And I just want to say that I thought that my premise of just randomly picking these books up in the airport and at bookstores uh, was upheld because they all had some kind of social commentary. They raised issues some I knew about, some I didn't. Uh, and then you can actually go through all of these and find the same case. So my random... You written them all. You written them all. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a one or two that I haven't yet, but I'm assuming that that will also be the case. So even, um, even this pro police procedural has got a whole other component commenting not on local uh, welfare society, but on international issues. So um, that is um, what they are doing. Where I'm going to end here. The novel is a social commentary, <clears throat> and uh, this one is probably the most escapist uh, because there are so many uh, twists and turns to it. Uh, but is that your favorite? Well, I did. I liked this because it was about an academic world. So <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your patience and for transferring. <laughs> I was wondering what the assassination of Olaf Palma has, it's mentioned in so many crime novels, I'm just wondering what the influence of that unsolved mystery is on. That is a great, a great point, yes. And, and that is a real unsolved crime. I've been to that place, I've been to actually that spot on the street. I mean, it's probably everybody who goes to Stockholm goes to see that spot. But um, I think it is part of this fascination and it might have started with something like that. Yeah, good question. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Right. He's talking about the uh, the role of the Russian mob in all of these countries, really, and especially in uh, in drug smuggling. So these drugs, especially heroin, are coming up from Afghanistan across Russia, and uh, Finland has the largest border uh, with uh, Russia, and so it's coming in that way. It's coming in from Estonia and going over to. And so those are real. Those are real instances. That is really happening. In fact, it was happening when I was there. They arrested some uh, half dozen Baltic people with uh, cases of, uh, of heroin. So, yes. But would many of the crime novels deal with that issue? Um, I'm not of these particular ones. No, Sipila does because. He again talking about whodunits and police procedurals more so he has but you know they usually just have petty criminals who somehow go awry um, they're maybe just people who are into um, you know selling lottery tickets illegally or something like that but then something bad happens and they end up in a crime with a weapon yes, yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yes, especially.
it would be because they were occupied. Yes. Question. One of the things I didn't mention about, uh, I think it is Nirkunen, he talks a lot about SUPO, which was the uh, secret police in Finland, and every one of these countries had some version of that, and she's absolutely right. They're always bringing that up as well. So, good point. Yes? I want to talk about the personal lives of these uh, detectives. Uh, I know Wallander is an yeah. anguish kind of guy. Right. How about the other ones? Is that is that a theme that goes through? Yes, yes. I would say that. Well, for example, in this one, uh, we hear a lot about the, uh, the detective's personal life, her family. She has a daughter. It's connected to the girl in the crime, and um, <coughs> her failed marriage. So a um, failed marriage is often, I mean, I don't know. Are there any happily married <laughs> detectives <laughs> here? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, right. So, and uh, well, hey, um, Wallander, he drinks too much, and I think there are probably a few others. In uh, Dinosaur Feather, the uh, one of the detective investigators falls in love with the suspect, and he uh, he does drink too much. So yes, the personal lives come in, and that's much more than was in the past in these the police procedural types. So it's wonderful. Yes. In this political part. Uh, first of all, a comment from Escape or Exposé. It occurs to me in our era of increasing real violence and so on, we are desensitized to the simple things and need something like more to get escape. But along with politics, when mm -hmm. we're talking about criticism of social democracy or whatever, mm -hmm. is there a alternative theme that comes through, like something libertarianism or some conservative theme? Is there any commonality that's talking about? Hmm. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. What I mean, that's actually because may, that may be where they are headed. I mean, what if if uh, what do you have to do to social democracy to tweak it to make it so that it doesn't have all of this? And that's what it's a it's a theological question in Frisarn, and that's why he's saying it doesn't have something to do with the loss of spirituality or connection. And then Osa Larson tries to bring it back to the connection to nature. You know, that we're we're in this problem because we're divorced from nature. So but good question. In, in the last yes. in the last um Nightfall novel, the the bad guy is an American spy. Uh huh. Which one is that? I can't remember the, the Is it this one? The uh no, it's the last one. He, where, where oh. he goes, he goes, uh, gets Alzheimer's and leaves. The oh picture. yes. Uh, oh, I haven't read that one yet. Today I found three of his books that I haven't but, read that have been his, buried in my shelf. But his shelf. bad guy is, is an American spy, yes. not a Russian spy. Mm, that's very common. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, as I think about uh, the American genre, especially uh, for uh, not only. Uh, crime fiction, but also true crime. True crime is huge in terms of popular literature. And if you go to the bookstores, you'll you know all the way back in the postmodern era. Yes, Truman Capote is in Cold Blood and Rules stuff that sells like you know hotcakes. Um, what is the status of the true crime genre in Scandinavia? Well, I think people, uh, I don't have an example of that from Sweden, but that is a very good question for me. Um, but people like this in, in Finland, he's keeping this alive there, and the Finnish uh, woman is also kind of more in the true crime uh, set. So I don't think that's going away there, because it's still novel enough. People are still interested in following all of that. Mm. I, I'm guessing. Yeah. No? Yeah, I was uh, struck when you said the world was coming unraveled and there's a surplus of evil. Doesn't that go right back to Norse mythology, where I believe evil is destroying the roots of the tree of life and will eventually destroy the world of man, the world of the gods, and will be triumphant? That sounds like a lot of this overriding. It's coming from there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's not what I want to think, but that's certainly been a topic for. For all time, as yeah. Sounds pretty close. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you expect uh, such a 
Yes, yes. Repeat absolutely. the question. She said that Dorothy Sayer and Agatha Christie were, were dominant, uh, were women writers in the in the past, and that's true. There, just now, there are, it's, I'm not sure, because I don't do statistics on this, is it balanced, but there are many more women than there were in the past, and that's what we're, you know, we're happy about some balance there. Yes? Where do you find these in the original language? Mm -hmm. In the original countries. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? And Where do you find over here? Well, uh, we probably can find some, and I would imagine Powell's has some because they have sections in languages, and you can probably find some in Seattle. You can get them on the internet. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Amazon UK. Amazon UK. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I usually I usually get them when I'm there, but at some point. Able to do that. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.